I thought that was a wonderful example with the children, with those students, getting enthusiastic about changing awareness of dyslexia. And um, I'd like to share with you this picture, which is by a dyslexic adult. Um, and he is now a, an artist, a well-respected artist um, and photographer. Uh, but when he was a child at school, he was very severely dyslexic and also Asperger's. Um, and this is his actual school pen. And so he's put the pins through the pen to show how painful for him writing as an experience was at school. And I think these different artistic forms and the, the way that dyslexics are expressing what it feels like for them to be dyslexic are really important ways of changing awareness. We have in England been um, campaigning for dyslexia awareness for about 40 years. Um, and so we are in the fortunate position that many of us who are dyslexic, who when we were at school had no provision for our dyslexia, are now adults. And adult dyslexics have very strong views about what should be done for dyslexics. And we are now um, trying to influence the whole of society, not just schools, but employment, every single organisation in society to be dyslexia aware. So, um, we have in England um, special education needs legislation. It was revised last year. It is very clear that every school has a duty to identify children who have uh, specific learning difficulties, including dyslexia. So there's a duty to identify, and there is a duty to provide appropriately for the needs of those children. Okay. Traditionally, within our education system, we have specialist dyslexia teachers and psychologists within the region who have a responsibility for assisting schools with identification and with setting up appropriate provision within the schools. Increasingly now, the responsibility is also on the classroom teachers because in, a, in an inclusive situation, what we say is all schools and all classrooms have dyslexic children in them. So every teacher is a teacher of dyslexic children. So we say on average 10% of the population has some degree of dyslexia. So in a class of 30 children, you have on average three children who are dyslexic. So every classroom needs to be dyslexia friendly. And every teacher should be trained to understand how to provide appropriately for that child. So for me, I think that Dyslexia is very unusual as a disability because it is one of the few occasions where that disability is to some extent preventable. So, it is, dyslexia is to a certain extent a preventable disability. You can't stop the child being born with the genetic profile for dyslexia but you can prevent it becoming a disability because you have an education system that doesn't teach the way that child learns. And to me, it's about a mismatch between the way the child learns and the way the teacher teaches. And that's why teacher education is such an important thing. So, um, we also have uh, Equalities Act law which says that all organisations in England must make reasonable adjustments for all disabilities, okay? And they are not allowed to discriminate. So a school, for example, must make um, uh, attempts to ensure that dyslexic children are not bullied, for example. Uh, that their needs are understood not only by the teachers but also by the peers. Um, in at universities, we have a government scheme called Dis Disabled Students Allowance, which means that the university must make 
um, provision for the individual at university, but also there is a separate funding from the government so that the students can have, for example, a laptop uh, software, speech text software, dictation software. They might use a recorder for their, their um, lectures. The, the lecturers themselves must be aware that the student is dyslexic. They must make re reasonable adjustments. So that might involve, for example, they provide the handouts in advance. Um, we have exam provisions, access arrangements throughout the education system for dyslexics. And we have uh, um, a, a set of regulations which sets out what those can be. So they might be things like extra time. It might be that that person, because they also have attention difficulties, must be in a separate room. It might be that they have rest breaks. They work for 20 minutes, they have a five minute rest break, and then they work for another 20 minutes. It might be that they have a prompter. So this is someone who, if, if they're losing attention, the prompter just touches the desk for them to refocus on what they're doing. And whether or not they have somebody who to physically write for them depends on the, the level of their need. So if they have very big difficulties with physically writing themselves, if there's a dysgraphia, for example, they may have the facility to be able to dictate what they want to say and, and somebody else will write it up for them. Um, we also have um, a government scheme to support dyslexics in the workplace. This is called the Access to Work Scheme and the idea is that it's for all disabilities, including dyslexia, and it is to enable disabled people to, to be in the workplace and to do their jobs to the best of their abilities. So this might include, for a severe dyslexic, a support worker working with them, helping them with proofreading, with prioritising, with organisational skills, with time management, with these things which are beyond the literacy skills difficulties that dyslexics have and go into the other cognitive processing um, as skills that they, they may have difficulty with. It may be that they also need to have a need for special equipment. It may be that they do need um, dictation software. And so that would be something that, that could potentially be provided under this government scheme. The British Dyslexia Association accredits a number of training courses for dyslexia specialist teachers. Um, at different levels, but also for teaching assistants, people who support dyslexics in classroom. We have professional members of people who have done those courses, and they have to update their practice every three years. So we have a practicing certificate, which is reissued every three years. Also, we train, we run a number of training courses, which are of, of perhaps one day or up to, say, four days duration, different, different levels of accreditation. And these are for teachers, teaching assistants, um, for uh, interested parties, but also for employers, for example. Um, and we run those up and down the country. So, uh, so far this year, we've run about 265 of those training courses around the country. Over a year, it's usually about 500. Um, and we, we organise a conference, so we have our international conference in March in Oxford, um, which is research from all over the world. But we also work increasingly with e-learning, e-learning modules, so that they can be accessed from anywhere as well. We have a summer school for teachers, because we, were, we had a lot of, of queries from people who wanted to come. Um, and so now we run a school, a week-long summer school, uh, for, for teachers from, from uh, wherever they wish to come from. Um, and uh, we have about um, 600 odd teachers a year who get accreditation through the, the British Dyslexia Association. We also do now workplace assessments. So this is not a diagnostic assessment for dyslexia. This is somebody going into the workplace under the Access to Work government scheme and having a conversation with an adult and saying, what do you need? What is difficult for you? What adjustments could the workplace make that would make your life easier? And what adjustments can you make that would make your work more effective? So it may be that the adjustment that the workplace can make is allowing that person to record meetings, for example. It may be that it's, it's giving them a separate desk so that they're not where everybody else is going to be distracting them. It may be 
that actually what's needed is training for their work colleagues about dyslexia awareness. So those might be recommendations under Access to Work. Um, one of our main campaigns is that we want all teachers to be trained in dyslexia awareness, whether they're teaching biology or physics or geography, they should all be trained in dyslexia awareness. Um, and Scotland it does, does actually do that. Um, they make sure that every single every single teacher, when they're training, has a component which is about dyslexia awareness. Northern Ireland has just recently been training a dyslexia specialist teacher for every primary school, every single primary school. We also have a dyslexia friendly quality mark. So this is dyslexia friendly schools and it's a whole organisation approach. So a dyslexia friendly school will have good early identification, it will have effective intervention, it will have all the teachers having had at least one day of awareness training, but it will also have a dyslexia friendly homework policy. So we know that parents are often very frustrated, the child gets home, they've forgotten what the homework was going to be, it's not down properly, they, they miss their deadlines, they have organisational skills difficulties. So a dyslexia friendly school might, for example, on the website for the school, put up what the homework is, what the child needs, which days they need certain equipment, that's a dyslexia friendly policy. So the policies within the school have to be dyslexia friendly, the practices have to be dyslexia friendly, and it goes from the signage around the school to the equipment in the classroom to the way that the teachers are getting the information away over to the, to the pupils. So they may, in, they may encourage the pupils, for example, to use different forms of recording. They might say, you don't always have to give me an essay, you can do a role play. You can video yourself. You can, you can tell me what you know about this subject. You don't always have to write it down. So dyslexia-friendly practices. And the dyslexia-friendly criteria we have now, not just for schools, but also for colleges, for universities, and for companies. We also have dyslexia-friendly youth offending services, because we know that some of these children end up going into the wrong channels. We have our first prison that's working on becoming dyslexia friendly and again it's a whole organisation approach. We have a number of publications and I would point out to you the Dyslexia Friendly Schools Good Practice Guide. This is where 10 local authorities, that's 10 education regions in the UK that have a long tradition now of dyslexia friendly schools where many of their schools are dyslexia friendly where the teachers put together their top tips of good practice. It's a really, really useful resource. Um, and then we have our employer's um, handbook. We have a good practice guide for employers. We have a good practice guide for justice professionals because we found that some of the children who were dyslexic who were getting into trouble with the law were not being appropriately dealt with. So, for example, when they are being interviewed by the police, sometimes they were getting things in the wrong order. They were misremembering, not remembering people's names. And this was being taken that they must be guilty, when actually it could have been partly, not always, but it could have been partly due to their dyslexia. Okay? So the good practice guide is, is a guide for professionals in the justice fields about how they should deal with those um, uh, occasions. Um, and then we have our various members' magazines and uh, newsletter and academic journal. So what we're aiming for is a dyslexia-friendly society. As far as I'm concerned, and I am biased because I'm dyslexic, uh, being dyslexic is normal. We are here in society. This is normal. 10% of the population is dyslexic, has some degree of dyslexia. And therefore, all society should be dyslexia friendly. And that should be normal, normal working uh, progress. Um, so, thank you all for your interest and thank you for the work that you're doing. <laughs>